Hello, I'm Dr. Frida, and I am here with my practice manager, Shador. Hello. And thank you for joining us for another YouTube Live. Today, we're having a real-time question and answer session on stroke. The reason I really want to do this topic at this time was because of the legendary John Singleton, who just died last week at the age of 51 from a stroke. And we learned after his passing that he has had a long time battle with hypertension, which is the leading cause of stroke. So ever since he had the unfortunate early passing, I've been getting a lot of questions asking why all these people are dying at such young ages of stroke and what kinds of things we can really do to help to prevent strokes and if there are treatments for strokes. I do want to take a mention to talk about John Singleton because he really was a trailblazer. He directed Boys in the Hood back in 1991, and he was only 22 years old when he directed this film. And after this film, he got nominated by the Oscars for Best Director, and he was the youngest person ever to be nominated for this category. And he was the first African-American to be nominated for Best Director. Since then, he's done many films such as Poetic Justice, where he had Janet Jackson and Tupac. He's done Too Fast, Too Furious, Higher Learning, all kinds of films. And people like Cuba Gooding Jr., Angela Bassett, Lawrence Fishburne. He even did the remake of Shaft with Samuel Jackson. So he's been that behind the scenes person who's really pushed a lot of people, particularly African-Americans, out to the forefront. and. He's a legend, and it's just such a shame that he's passed. But certainly, and I've seen um, in the social media and in the news where his family wants to bring awareness to hypertension and to strokes. And so I really wanted us to do, to do our part to help bring awareness. With that being said, let's talk about strokes. We're going to be taking your questions, so please just type in questions, and we'll take them and answer them real time. I'll give a little background on strokes. A stroke occurs when there is a disruption of proper brain, brain uh, a, disru a disruption of proper blood flow or oxygen flow to the brain. So the blood supply is cut off in the proper manner. There are a couple different types of strokes, which we will get into. There's an ischemic stroke, and then there's a hemorrhagic stroke, and we'll talk more about that. In America, over 795,000 people get strokes each year. And 7 million people in America are living with strokes. And the really interesting thing is that we believe that over 80% of strokes are actually preventable. And so that's really what I want to talk about, how we can prevent strokes. So that's really what I want to talk about, how we can prevent strokes. So let's see, Ms. Shador, if we have any questions. Uh, I'm going to start with, I guess, just a generic question. How do you get a stroke and what exactly is a stroke? Okay. All right. So... The way that you get a stroke, so one of two ways, either that blood supply, the artery, which provides oxygen to the brain is blocked and it can be blocked by a plaque or like a fatty buildup. And so you stop that stream of blood flow and that's one way to cause an ischemic stroke. Or you can actually have a clot or a plaque that travels from someplace outside of the brain and blocks it. That's another type of ischemic stroke and that's called an embolic stroke. So there are two types of ischemic strokes, thrombotic, where you just have a blockage of the artery that supplies a part of the brain, and then embolic, where that plaque or clot actually travels. And those clots, those can travel from places like the neck arteries or the carotid arteries, or from the heart, especially if you have an abnormal heart rhythm, you can get a clot in the heart that travels. Another way you can get a stroke is from an, a bleed or a hemorrhagic stroke especially when you have high blood pressure and some of the arteries that supply oxygen to the brain can actually burst and you bleed out. So now you're not getting the oxygen. And so those are the, the basic definitions on what is a stroke. Okay. Um, I've noticed before um, with some of our chart uh, records, I may see TIA. Okay. So TIA, transient ischemic attack, and it's more commonly known as a mini stroke. When you get a TIA or a mini stroke, that means that you can get stroke symptoms, but they last for less than 24 hours and then they're resolved. And so you don't necessarily have that facial weakness or that 
that arm weakness for a long term. You have these symptoms for less than 24 hours because you had a transient ischemia. You had a blockage to the proper blood flow to the brain, but then it went away. So what does that mean? It means you're at very, very, very high risk for having an actual permanent stroke and having long-term damage. So if you've had a mini stroke or a TIA, look at it as a blessing in disguise because it's warning you that you're at high risk and perhaps you still have time to make some lifestyle changes to prevent prevent some other strokes. So they are preventable in the future if you take those, uh, make those changes in your life. Yes, yes, they're potentially preventable. Okay, let's know. Um, I was told I had a mini stroke, not me personally, just a question. <laughs> um, to say I walk just fine and don't have any symptoms. Does that mean I'm okay? You know, if, if, if a person has had a mini stroke and then those symptoms have resolved, then they can be okay, but they're at high, high risk for stroke. So if they have some of these risk factors, then they need to do whatever they can to change them, such as hypertension. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. How do you know exactly um, if you're having a stroke? I heard of a, a acronym, FAST. That's right. So that FAST is wonderful because the letters F-A-S-T, that's all you need to remember in order to know if you may be having a stroke or if a loved one may be having a stroke. So the F in FAST is for facial drooping. If you notice that your face is drooping on one side, if you smile, but that smile, only half of your face smiles, that's you could be having a stroke. And then the A for arm weakness. If one of your arms is weak, if you can't lift it or do what you normally do, that's another warning sign that you could be having a stroke. S is for speech. If your speech is no longer clear, if it's garbled or just you, if you can't speak properly, that could be a warning sign for a stroke. And then if you're having the F, the A, and the S, then T, it's time to call 911. Don't sit and talk yourself out of it. Just go ahead and call 911. It's interesting. I have a patient I see in my practice here at Emory and she actually came in after having a stroke and she walked around with symptoms that are in that fast F-A-S-T for 24 hours before she did anything because she just kept talking herself out of it. She said, oh, maybe I slept wrong or maybe, you know, I just sat on my my leg strangely and that's why it's weak. She sat there, talked herself out of it, put on a full face of makeup. She told me, got dressed went shopping, happened to pass an urgent care center. And because she was still having these symptoms, the facial weakness, the arm weakness, leg weakness, she just walked in there during her shopping spree to ask if she could possibly be, ha possibly be having a stroke. Her blood pressure was sky high. She'd had a stroke. But if she had called 911 right away, who knows what kind of reversal she could have had. It's possible that she could have not had some of the permanent symptoms. So don't wait. If you're having the facial drooping, arm weakness, speech change, it's time to call 911 right away. Is that very common for people to be like, oh, dismiss it, so to speak? <clears throat> Absolutely it is. And I find that it's even more common for women. The same way that a lot of women will talk themselves out of the heart symptoms they're having, which is why so many women are affected by heart disease, they'll talk themselves out of stroke symptoms because they don't have time to be sick. They have to take care of their families, their children, their jobs, their households, their communities, their churches. A lot of times women are so busy taking care of other people that we don't take care of ourselves. So in order to help other people to live healthy, happy lives, you have to take care of yourself and live your healthiest and happiest life. And remember to make yourself a priority in health. If you don't take care of yourself, you won't be around to take care of others. So don't downplay any symptoms that you may be having women or anyone else who out there who tends to put others before themselves all the time. You have to take care of your health. That's the only way you can be a vessel in this life to help others. Okay. Thank you. Um, Going back to the symptoms mm -hmm. uh, of fast, is there a typical side you may see it more on the left or the right when you have these, like the drooping of the face? Or no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. It's interesting for the brain, as far as the part of the brain that controls the the motor actions in your arms, your legs, your body. It tends to be the opposite side. So if you have a stroke that affects your right side of your brain then the weakness may be in the left arm or the left leg. But really, it can go either way. Um, and you may have facial drooping on one side, arm weakness on the other. So 
No, it can be either way. Okay. Thank you. Um, um, is there like an age range for people having strokes? That's a good question. That's a good question. Age? Especially with all of these young people who are getting strokes. So most people will get strokes after the age of 65. However, even if you are 40, that's already an independent risk factor for getting a stroke. And as you can see with the unfortunate early passing of John Singleton at the age of 51, and then Luke Perry, who also died at a very young age, just a month before, it can happen to young people. And the actual age that people are getting strokes has decreased. People are getting strokes earlier. According to the American Heart Association, heart disease and stroke statistics, the average age for a man to get a stroke is 73. And for, a, I'm sorry, the average age of a woman to get a stroke is 73 and for a man at 68. So it can be any age. It really just depends on your risk factors that you have. Okay. Uh, we have a question here from Daphne. Hi, Daphne. Hi, Daphne. Uh, Daphne says, I've seen results of strokes and usually to the effect only one side of the body. Uh, does it ever affect the entire body at the same time? It can, but that's very rare. So Daphne, when you're seeing those results where it's happening to one side of the body, that means that usually something has happened, either a brain bleed, brain bleed on one side of the brain or some ischemia or blockage on one side, <coughs> excuse me, and then the opposite side of the body is weak. Is it possible for it to happen on both sides? Yes, it is possible, but much less likely. So yes, usually you are gonna see it on one side. Okay. The weakness. All right, thank you, Daphne. Uh, next question is from Don. Hi, Don. Uh, <laughs> can you address how stress may affect the chances of having a stroke? Oh my goodness. Stress is a real trip because stress affects everything. And I think a lot of time we a lot of times we downplay how much stress can affect every aspect of our lives and it can definitely affect health. Anytime you have stress, you release certain stress hormones in your body like cortisol, adrenaline, those fight or flight hormones. And when you release those things, they cause a tightening of the blood vessels. What happens when your blood vessels are tight? The pressure against them increases. So stress can cause high blood pressure. High blood pressure is the leading cause for strokes. So if you're someone who is stressed or if you have anxiety, then those are huge risk factors for having a stroke. So when people tell you to calm down or to try to really check your stress, it's not just so you're you know, happy. And of course we all want to be happy, but it's also for your life so that you're living. So stress can have a direct effect on high blood pressure, which is a leading cause of strokes. So some things that you can do to decrease stress, of course, you want to do time management and try to get to places early so that you're not running around stressed, fighting in the parking lot or fighting like we do in this Atlanta traffic. You also may want to do things like meditation or do slow breathing. When you do slow breathing, that tends to slow your heart rate and to help those blood vessels to open, to dilate, which decreases your stress. And I actually have a video, one of my YouTube videos on stress. So if you look on this channel, the Dr. Frida channel, and type in Dr. Frida stress, then you'll find some ways to manage stress and help to prevent yourself from having a stroke. Thank you for that question. Hypertension as well, right? Hypertension for sure, yes. Oh, the hypertension video. Yes, I have a YouTube video on hypertension on the definition, because the definition changed in 2017. And I talk about ways to prevent hypertension. So you can look up that YouTube video on my channel. That's right. Oh, thank you. A couple of viewers, Samantha says, thank you for this video. Hi, Samantha. She appreciate it. Um, Daphne is back again. Uh, she says, I think someone is having a stroke. How can I help? The best thing you can do is to call 911. But in the meantime, this is a good question, Daphne. One thing you want to do is speak in a calm, soft boys. Why? Because if that person has worsened anxiety or stress, it can make the symptoms worse. So it's important that you remain calm or at least look calm, even if you're not calm. That will help. The other thing is that you want to position the person in a way where his or her head is elevated a little, maybe 30 degrees. Why? Because, and because the person, depending on what happens with the stroke, could actually be nauseated and could vomit. And what you don't want is for them to aspirate or to breathe in any of that vomit into their lungs and cause pneumonia. So you want to elevate them if you can just a little and turn their head to the side. So in case they vomit, it's not 
coming on them. I would not give them any medicine. I would just activate 911 because sometimes the way that you swallow is affected by a stroke and you don't want them trying to swallow and getting it into their lungs. So don't feed them. Call 911 and try to be positive and calm, even in that stressful situation. That was a very good question. Thank you, Daphne. Now, when you mentioned medicine, mm -hmm. what type of medicine would someone might try to give a person who's having a stroke? That's a good question. So, you know, if you if a person is having a heart attack, you know, and they have all of their faculties, they can think, they can chew, they can swallow, then chewing an aspirin can help to keep those platelets from sticking together and possibly help to decrease the clotting that's happening when you're having a heart attack. Well, a stroke is a brain attack. And so you would think that aspirin might be able to do the same thing, which it could. But the difference is that when the brain is affected, the way you swallow may be affected. And when you're trying to help and give a person medicine and you're not the actual EMS, the 911 crew or the hospital, you might actually actually be making that person aspirate or take the medicine into their lungs, which is a whole nother set of problems. So activate 911. Time is brain. The longer it takes you to get the patient to the hospital, the more permanent brain loss they could have. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Janice and Lucia, thank you for joining Hi. us and as well. Um, what does heart disease have to do with having a stroke? Heart disease, that's a very good question. So I mentioned earlier that you have the two types of strokes, ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. And ischemic is the most common. 87% of strokes are ischemic where you have a blockage of blood flow. Well, the two types of ischemic strokes are the embolic stroke where the plaque or the clot comes from outside the body. And the other one is the thrombotic that I mentioned where you just have that blockage or that fatty deposit that's in the artery. So the heart disease comes in. Well, heart disease is a risk factor for having strokes, but very specifically, if you have atrial fibrillation, also called AFib, that's when your heart beats in an erratic, an erratic manner. It's irregularly irregular. And when you have a heart that's beating like that, you have a likelihood of getting a clot inside of your heart. That clot can actually escape from the heart and travel into the brain. So if you have heart disease, specifically AFib, then you're at risk for having clots in the heart and you're at risk for getting an embolic stroke. So what do you do? Number one, you consult your physician, specifically the cardiologist. And a lot of times with AFib, they'll have you on a blood thinner to help prevent you from getting those strokes. In addition, they'll do treatments or medication, depending on what the indication is, to actually try to get that heart to be in a normal, a normal beat. But that's a good question. Okay. Yeah. And remember, this video is informative. It's an informative video, but it, is, it does not replace a consultation with your doctor. So if you're having specific questions about you or a loved one, please do see your physician. This is just an informational video on a YouTube live. All right. Last shout out to Mary as well. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, I have a question um, for like diseases, high, high blood pressure, diabetes that mm -hmm. are hereditary. Um, if you have a family history of stroke, is that also, is that possibly passed on as well? Yes. If you have a family history of strokes, especially if, you, if it's in a first degree relative, like a parent, a sibling, a child, then that increases your risk. Other risk factors, high blood pressure that I keep mentioning is a very high, the leading risk factor. And John Singleton did indeed have high blood pressure. Diabetes is a risk factor for stroke. Also, if you have obesity or sedentary lifestyle, that's a risk factor for a stroke. Cigarette smoker. If you're a cigarette smoker, that increases your risk for stroke as well. So all of, all of these things increase your risk. And if you have a family history, then you need to make sure that you are following up with your physician because you are at an increased risk for stroke. Thank you. Um, have any children been known to have strokes? That's a good question. Yes. Yes. Now, of course, age is a risk factor. So the older you are, the more likely you are to have a stroke. But there are certain diseases that children get now as our population, especially in America, is getting more and more overweight, more and more obese at younger ages. We have children who are getting what used to be called adult onset diabetes. We have children who are getting diabetes type 2. They are at increased risk. We have children who have high blood pressure. And then also certain kids have thick blood, blood that um, makes them more likely to form clots, especially kids who have lupus or other types of illnesses which can lead to clotting disorders. 
they are at risk for having strokes as well. So even though in the general population, it's not as likely for children to get strokes, but if you have a child and you see them having that fast, facial drooping, arm weakness, the speech has changed, it's still time to call 911. It's a good question. Thank you for the question, Mary. Thank um, you. What type of testing can be done, uh, I guess, to not necessarily prevent the stroke, but if you've had one? Okay. Okay. That's a good question. So if you are having stroke symptoms, you call 911, you're going to the ER. What they will do is they'll do an EKG to see if you're having that atrial fibrillation or the abnormal heart rhythm. They will also do some blood tests to see if you're having a heart attack. Because one thing about a stroke, it can alter the way that you think and you may not even realize you're having ch chest pain. And so the ER will take care of that. They will also do a scan of your brain, a CAT scan or a CT scan. And that will help them to see if you're having a brain bleed or if, there anything, if there's anything else that's going on that makes them think that you're having a stroke. They can do MRIs as well because sometimes the CAT scans will take a while to actually show up the exact um, disease process that's going on in the brain, but the CT scan is fast and that can happen in the ER. Also, they may take a look at those arteries, those neck arteries or carotid arteries to see if you have any kind of a blockage or something making them think that you could have had an embolic stroke from the carotid artery. And then of course, they'll make sure that your oxygen is good and they'll check your blood sugar and really start to look for the different risk factors. So these are some of the tests that can be done after you're having symptoms of stroke, but prevention is the key to try to, to not have a stroke. How do you prevent strokes? You go through all of these risk factors and you try to minimize them or eliminate them. If you have high blood pressure, go to your doctor, get it controlled. Exercise, you should be limiting the salt in your diet. Most people should have no more than 1,500 milligrams of sodium or salt a day. That sounds like a lot, is not, is not. If you think about the vegetarian sausages, for example, mm -hmm. like two little vegetarian sausage links, that sounds pretty healthy, right? Mm -hmm. 300 milligrams of sodium. How many of y'all watching like ketchup? Y'all know y'all like ketchup. If you get one little tablespoon of ketchup, 197 milligrams of sodium. And then even like canned corn can have up to 500 milligrams of sodium. So I really want you to be label watchers, label watchers and try to have low salt in your diet. And then if you are a tobacco smoker, you want to try to stop that habit because it's a risk factor for stroke and a whole lot of other things, including lung cancer and kidney cancer and all kinds of things. You definitely don't want to smoke cigarettes and I have a video on vaping. You should watch that also on my YouTube here. And what else? If you're obese, you want to talk to your doctor about a good weight loss management. So basically, stroke prevention is the most important thing that you can do. I have a question. Um, if you have a history of stroke or you've had maybe a couple of strokes in your lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, could you continue to be followed by your primary care physician or should you see a specialist? Right. Now, you always want to see your primary care physician because that's that doctor who is that gatekeeper who's doing everything. But Absolutely. If you're having recurrent strokes, you want to see a neurologist, a doctor who specializes in strokes and who specializes in brain disorders, because you want to find out why in the world you're having strokes. Is it just because of those things that I've listed as risk factors? Or do you have some type of a, a clotting issue? Or do you have some type of a neurologic disorder that needs to be addressed? So you want to see a neurologist if you are having recurrent strokes. Uh, the impression you're a stroke waiting to happen, walking around the stroke. Uh, what does that mean? You're a stroke waiting to happen? Yeah. I never heard that. I guess a person that has very, very high blood pressure and you about to stroke out. Oh, that's so rude. You're a stroke waiting to happen. But I guess if you look at a person, some risk factors you can see. Like you can see if a person is obese or if you know a person and they're sedentary, you can tell that. But if you also know that the person has high blood pressure, diabetes, and you see them eating all kinds of unhealthy foods, I guess somebody who's not, you know, feeling so tactful <laughs> could say you're a stroke waiting to happen. But what I want you to be is prevention waiting to happen. So I want everyone to please share the information about how you can prevent strokes and so that we can stop having all these untimely deaths. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my page and make sure you hit the notification button. I'm gonna be doing YouTube Lives every month. And if you have pressed the notification, then you'll know right away anytime new videos are coming up or any 
uh, the live videos and the question and answer sessions are coming up. Also, please comment. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, and let's see. I asked you one more question. You have more questions. One thank more before you for we close up. Um, from Gladine, Paul. Hi. Um, how long does it take if you have bleeding in the head for from hypertension and the blood is stable from the last MRI? Wow, that's a good question. It's going to vary from person to person. So that bleeding in the head, that is that hemorrhagic stroke, that brain bleed stroke that I talked about. And those can be devastating, really catastrophic. If you have bleeding in the head, then sometimes that blood can put pressure on your brain. It can cause really, really devastating symptoms. So sometimes a neurosurgeon will actually have to do something, a procedure where they drain a hole in the skull and they have to drain the blood out of the head. But the thing is with the hypertension and depends on the person, it depends on the metabolic rate. It varies from person to person how long you know, it's been um, based on, on this question. But I'm glad you did bring up hemorrhagic stroke. Either way, T, time to call 911 if you're having that, that issue. All right, thank you for that question, question Gladine. All right, well, that ends our YouTube live, our, our lunchtime live. Again, I appreciate everyone who took the time to tune in to watch us. Again, we will be doing monthly live Q and A's. Make sure you check out my channel, you comment. If you have any suggestions for live video topics, I want to hear them. And if you've had any kind of an issue with a stroke, either personally, or if you know of a loved one, please share and make sure you share this video and look at the stroke video that I did previously last month. Share it with anyone who you think may be at risk for stroke. Thanks for watching. Do your best. Live that healthy, happy life.